Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Ung, and I'd like to welcome you to the Swiss Re Corporate Solutions webinar, Insurance Solutions for the Hardening Market Asia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Before we get started, some quick housekeeping. I would like to bring your attention first to the Q&A chat box on the left side of the screen. Please type in any questions that you may have throughout the webinar. We'll look to get to your questions towards the end of the session. Secondly, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please hit Control F5 to refresh. Finally, this webinar will be recorded, so feel free to share it with your colleagues after the call. Now let's get started. Today we'll talk about the hardening insurance market. What economic conditions contribute to its current state, why that can present challenges for clients, and briefly look at some alternative risk transfer solutions out there. Joining me today, I'm very pleased to have Andre Martin, Head of Innovative Risk Solutions for Asia Pacific, Thomas Keist, Global Captive Solutions Leader, and Irina Fan, Head Insurance Market Analysis, Group Economic Research and Strategy from the Swiss Re Institute, who will kick off the webinar with a brief economic overview. Irina, over to you. Thank you, Erica. So, um well, from my side, it's the early morning in, in Zurich. Very happy to um, able to join this discussion today. If you look at uh, you know um, the title of this um, presentation, then we talk, we talk about the recovery and the scenario. So one thing to to highlight is that you know this picture tells us that you know we don't know where would we land. And then the scenario also tells us that you know there is a time of uncertainty. So um, let us see, you know, for the Asia Pacific region, it is so closely integrated with the world, we have to put it in the global picture. So um, I think uh, everyone of us, you know, that, you know, this time, you know, the COVID-19 really pushed the world into a very sharp and deep global recession. So I don't think I need to tell you how sharp it is. I think we can feel it. But how deep is this global recession? So let us compare with you know or the latest one that you know is the global financial crisis during 2008 and 2009. If you look at the um, at that time, the global economy contracted by about I say less than two percent. But today, we expect you know, the world GDP to contract by more than 4%. So this is, tells you that that would be twice as deep compared with the um, global financial crisis. And if you look at this project number, we would have to say that this is, will be, we are facing the deepest recessions, uh, global recessions in the modern history or in our lifetime. So um, if you look at, you know, the two charts on the left-hand side, so the upper one shows, you know, um, how we give a big picture of the global economy. The red dotted line represents the COVID and, you know, the green line represents, you know, um, uh, what happened in the global financial crisis. And if you look at the lower, uh, the, the bottom one, this is the similar picture we also see from the Asian economy. As I mentioned, they are so integrated into the, the global economy. And um, for, um, for, the, um, for, for that, so what are the, the, the things that we would like to highlight here? You know, look at the three bullets on the right hand side, three points I'd like to highlight here. First one, as I said, you know, uh, this is a, a, a typical global recession, which is very deep and fast and sharp. And secondly, you know, actually government, this time they work, we act very fast. Um, I think also uh, because due to the previous uh, recession experience. So, um, you know, uh, in fact, this time we have to say that it is all depends on the, whether governments still have money in their pocket. It's more on the fiscal stimulus. Because since the financial crisis, a lot of central banks have already uh, keep the monetary policy at a very low or accommodative level so that there's not much the global central banks can do. But here in Asia, there's still some room. Uh, you know, we can still see some, uh, some central banks, they have uh, be able to make some um, uh, rate cuts to really to support the economy. So this time, 
actually all the support really come from the fiscal stimulus. So give you the context. So globally, the fiscal stimulus announced or launched so far was more than the aggregate of the last 50 years, 5-0. Okay. And in Asia, look at the number. For instance, in Hong Kong, um, the fiscal stimulus support is about 10% of GDP. Korean, Thailand, 14%. Malaysia, 17%. Singapore, 20%. And Japan, 40% of the GDP. So with, with all this, you know, uh, uh, massive stimulus, we, we, and also government and central banks are, you know, really um, keen to, to uh, really um, support the growth, then we know that the interest rate are going to stay for longer. I mean, we know that um, from Japan, you know, interest rates already be zero. And it's not the worst case. In Europe, they're negative, okay? And then, uh, you know, in most part of Asia also, you know, interest rates are now at their historical low. And, well, but then, even with, with all these um, uh, measures, we still see the recovery path could be portrayed. Even though you see probably like a V-shape, but one thing we want to highlight is that there will be huge output losses this time. And we, ex we, we estimate that, you know, or expect the, um, the uh, output losses globally will be around US dollar 12 trillion, exceed that amount, uh, you know, by, uh, until the end of next year. So, w w well, how big is that? It's about the size of the GDP of China. So we were going to have China disappear, like, you know. So this is something, this is very material. And um, let us, you know, look at, zoom into, actually into the region. So um, we look at the uh, latest economic momentum. So uh, one of the things we could look at is the, um, uh, the purchasing manager index. So on the left-hand side, so you can see that basically across all markets, you know, um, there are some momentum of the recovery you can see. Um, one thing to highlight is that, you know, actually China is the only one probably now that, uh, uh, I would say that on the front of the global recovery. Many of the um, markets still facing contract contracting economic activities. But in China, it's already back to um, the, the uh, positive um, uh, region. So for instance, for China, the second quarter GDP already um, is a positive 3.2%, but say in Singapore, it's still negative 13.2%, Philippines is still negative 16.5%, uh, India, you know, uh, contract by 24%, and Hong Kong contract 9%. And even the purchasing um, uh, managers in the so that you know, many of the markets they are recovering on the on track to re recovery, but still uh, below the uh, 50, the threshold for expansion of economic activity. So, um, so on on the um, right hand side, we try to show you that you know how we see um, in the in the region how different markets you know the. This year's we, um, GDP compare uh, with next year so that you can see who does better. But one thing I like to highlight here, this we, we prepared this um, chart about uh, three, four weeks ago, and then we, 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 we visited the economic conditions in every month. And when I, after I submitted this um, uh, chart here, and then we already have some downward revision of the GDP here. So... This is, again, to highlight the, the point of uncertainty. Uh, at this time of heightened uncertainty due to, you know, we see that still some recent indications of, uh, you know, increased, you know, COVID-infected numbers elsewhere in the, in, in, in the um, uh, globally and also in the region. So that's why uh, we have this revision. So um, let us look at, you know, um, this one. So. Um, if you look at the left-hand side, we actually we uh, look at the stringency indices. It's also see that you know how it uh, you know the uh, different economy res it responded or the policy responses to this COVID. You see that you know uh, uh, we can already see some easing trends in most of the markets. You know since the peak in April. However, in June uh, there are some. 
uh, pick up in in the numbers of the COVID uh, 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 infected numbers in June, and we can see this there are reverse of some more strict measures, or some will keep their measures strict and don't want to release. So this is the one that really affecting the uh, the economic activities and the GDP. So if you look at the right hand side. Um, this is, to, you know, the indices we try to measure how much the um, the GDP or economic activities be back to the peak COVID level. If you look at it, then you know at the peak, you know, during uh, April or so, then uh, you know the uh, the global GDP uh, shortfall was around most of the country a phrase around um, you know 15 to 20 percent, you know, uh, uh, lower than you know the peak COVID. Even today, if you look at there are some recovery, but they are still um, five or ten percent uh, below the peak COVID level, and we do not really expect the economic TV be able to return to hundred percent this year. So that's why you can see um, if all this, then you know, or uh, we see that the economic activity is going to be very severely affected here. So I put out this slide is want to highlight that you know, given this. Heightened uncertainty and COVID still unfolding. We are giving you any point estimate may not be, you know, correct or you know outdated in in a few weeks time. So I think in this point of time that it's really that the the thinking of I would say scenario thinking is most important. So here I just want to highlight one thing. I think uh, in the market most of people talk about you know even more or uh, a deeper uh, a recession. But here I would I had highlight one thing is we put up a stagflation scenario. The stagflation scenario may not come up in near term one or two years, but that could be some medium term risk for the inflation. So um, given all this massive uh, uh, government, uh, 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 I would say, uh, stimulus measures, and also the central bank mindset, really, they, they really would like to have all sorts of reasons with their high debt level, want to keep the interest rate low. So with a high inflation and low interest rate scenario, this is not something, uh, I would say, which we assigned uh, probability, if you look at it, it's still, you know, all this 10 to 15 percent. This uh, something that is not really like, oh, it's not going to happen. So this is things that we have to watch out. So with that, though, I will try to, to, to conclude today the economic picture that, you know, we have an atypical global recession that will have a protracted recovery and interest rate will stay very low for longer and then even negative in some markets. And all this um, I would say our uh, government's uh, very massive support to keep the growth there. However, there will be different recovery um, uh, pace. So China will lead the global recovery. Asia Pacific will do better than the rest of the world. And you know, uh, peace understood that. You know, I want to end it like this is a time of uncertainty. Okay, and that's all from my side. And I will over to you, Andrew, to share, you know, with the audience what we can do or some of the solutions during this time of uncertainty. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Rina, and, and thank you for uh, providing these insights on the broader economic um, outlook. Now, uh, the question is actually, what what do these trends actually mean for corporations, and more importantly? How can we as an insurance carrier help our customers to navigate these, these difficult times? And I think we all have seen um, in the recent parts in some shape or form the, the statistics on insurance rate development. And while 2019 saw the onset of a firming or hardening market globally, I think this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has certainly added and accelerated this uh, hard, um, hardening market trend. Now, a part of this very uncertain uh, economic outlook, uh, the COVID-19 recession will certainly also lead to budgetary constraints in a number of sectors. So this means there are a number of companies or many companies who will just have less discretionary spending available for insurance um, as they might have had in the past. Now, an, another trend that we are observing is an increase or that, that risk managers are becoming more risk alert. So a lot of companies, I think, were a bit surprised or taken by surprise by the severity and the extent of this pandemic impact. 
And we see a lot of uh, risk managers now going feverishly through their risk registers and looking if there are not other risks, other exposures that they might not have had on the radar and left uninsured. Now, this very difficult business environment now coincides with this hardening or um, tightening insurance market. And this not only translates into higher insurance prices, but also capacity constraints, I mean, in particular for NETCAD, and then also a more restricted scope of covers given in policy wordings. Let's not forget that there's still an ongoing shift in the corporate world from moving from tangible to intangible meaning that corporations are deriving more and more revenue from intangible assets like data or intellectual property. And I think this is an area where the insurance sector as a whole has been yeah, very slow and, and, and not very proactive in, in providing solutions. Now, in this situation of a hardening insurance market compounded by a pandemic, um, we see that a lot of risk managers and, and corporations are looking for solutions in this alternative risk transfer market. And broadly speaking, you can actually, actually um, group the requirements into three main categories. First of all, I mean, there's a need for solutions to fill the protection gap that is left by conventional insurance programs. Then there is a need for solutions that provide longer term certainty, both for budget, but also for capacity. And then with less budget available and rising prices, I mean, there comes a point where risk transfer might not, no longer be the most effective way forward for corporations. And we actually see a number or increasing number of companies who are and should be considering uh, to retain more risk. And this then leads really for a, a demand for solutions that help them with optimizing these retentions. Now, to address these challenges, I mean, there are solutions available, and um, some of them are new developments, but some others are actually existing solutions just coming back to prominence, um, maybe in a slightly different shape or form. So on one hand, we have uh, these parametric solutions or index-based solutions. We certainly have seen an increased visibility and increased uh, popularity over the last couple of years. And as we will see in, in a later slide, is these parametric solutions have proven to be a very powerful instrument to actually fill the gaps of traditional or conventional insurance programs. And in particular, when it comes to these uh, intangible exposures. Then we have structured uh, insurance solutions, and this essentially is uh, are mostly multi-year contracts giving this longer term certainty of price and capacity, and very often these are complemented with some gain share, pain share features. Now, um, with, with this trend of retaining more risk, also captives are becoming more and more prominent and gaining more popularity again. And, uh, and with that, also the demand for cap, uh, captive solutions, be it on the fronting side, but also on the captive protection side. And then my colleague uh, Tom Keist will finish off and, and introduce you to an alternative to corporate captives, namely our value proposition for what we call the virtual captives. Essentially, this is a contractual agreement which mimics all the benefits and the cash flow of having a captive without actually owning a captive, and thereby really by pre- or post-financing elements um, uh, help our clients to, to optimize their retentions. But let's start with uh, parametric solutions. And uh, for those who are not yet so familiar with the concept, a maybe very quick fundamental recap. As we all know, I mean, traditional or conventional insurance is purely indemnity-based. So that means uh, the idea is to compensate the insured for the cost that they incur for the repair or replacement of a physical asset that has been damaged. Now, parametric insurance is fundamentally different because it only ensures the probability of a pre-agreed event occurring. So it relies 100% on the measurement of an event or an index, like for example, the magnitude of an earthquake or the, the storm category of a typhoon. And once this measurement meets or exceeds an agreed threshold, the policy is triggered and a payout follows just automatically. And with this, these parametric insurances are completely detached and independent from any underlying physical asset. 
which allows them to cover these pure financial losses. The payout is usually formulaic, very transparent, because it's a simple formula, a function of this measured index or event. Now, based on these, um, based on these um, uh, fundamental principles, um, what are the benefits and what are the applications of these parametric insurances? So, most of the time we see them deployed to cover what we call uninsurable asset classes or uninsurable perils. Um, like, for example, too many rainy days delaying a construction project, or cover for overhead transmission lines, which is a very standard exclusion of traditional treaties. Then we, another application would be for, uh, to protect uh, corporations against pure financial, pure economic losses, which are not uh, triggered or not caused by a physical damage. And this is then the area where we're entering the whole domain of non-damage business interruption. And one very classic example is really to cover supply chain disruption. A third example or application is wherever there is scarce net cap capacity, because these parametric uh, structures are very handy instrument to access additional cap capacity, additional capital sources outside of the insurance world via cap bonds or insurance linked securities. Last but not least, uh, because the claims process is so transparent and quick. I mean, they're very handy when the quick access to liquidity and the quick access to cash flow immediately after an event is of importance. Like for governments, when they need this liquidity to, um, to provide um, like shelter and emergency relief actions immediately after a major catastrophe. But I think most important to note is that parametric insurance is not designed to replace traditional insurance programs. It is designed to complement it, to sit side by side a traditional program and fill the, programs, uh, the, the, the gaps uh, left by these conventional programs. Now on the right hand side I have just uh, shown a, a couple of possible triggers and applications. And I think as you would all expect, still the most prominent and popular application is in the NETCAT area. So here we're talking typhoon, earthquake, flood and drought. But parametric insurance is not only for extreme events. I mean, it can also cover just inclement or just adverse weather. Like for example, uh, too many rainy days, too many windy days, or too many hot days. On the flip side, then can also be used to uh, cover resource risk, like not enough wind, not enough sunshine uh, for renewable energy projects. And then over the, recent over the past couple of years, we've seen an increased interest in also non-weather related indices. And here just a few examples are to cover a loss of attraction of a tourism spot, um, which is then measured by uh, hotel occupancy rates or in industry indexes like the RAFPA index. Another application could be um, supply chain disruption, which is caused by the insolvency of a key supplier or the loss of license of a key supplier. Now, um, going back to the earlier slide, I've said that a second trend that we're observing in the hard market is this um, need for long-term certainty. And here, a very simple multi-year contract uh, can be a very attractive value proposition for the client. On one hand, it actually provides the certainty of budget and capacity uh, for multiple years, but then also it allows to diversify over time. And this means it's a much more efficient use of capacity for rare large events because you're using them in an aggregate rather than just stacking up or piling up uh, idle capacity year after year after year. And in particular, in a hard market where uh, the net cap capacity is becoming volatile and expensive, um, one could imagine or a value proposition would be to, uh, to do multi-year protection for a single peril or a net cap carve-out. And uh, this also would have an advantage because it could help to free up man-made insurance capacity from other insurers whose participation in the current program is limited by this net cap element. As I said before, usually these um, uh, multi-year contracts are, um, or, uh, include some kind of a pain-share-gain-share element. And this is 
uh, by basically either it's pre-funded and then uh, has a profit sharing, low claims bonus or no claims bonus on it, or it's post-funded where the insured then reimburses part of their losses um, as additional premium after the event. Um, now I have shown two extreme cases and the, 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 the structure of these features is actually quite flexible. And it really depends on the loss pattern uh, and the industry, which one makes more sense and adds uh, or gives better value. Now, one would be, for, an, uh, for example, for a severity level, uh, uh, layer, uh, the so-called swing deals, which are features that add an additional premium, a one-off single uh, additional premium uh, at the first loss in the layer could be quite attractive for these severity layers. If you have more of a frequency layer, then probably more of a loss corridor, which has different attachment points for these uh, additional premium, um, could be more valuable for this client. Now, I have to note, however, that due to uh, regulatory compliance uh, consideration, not all the features that are available uh, can be deployed in, in all the jurisdictions. And this leads me to the topic of captives. Now, as you would expect, the uh, hard market is very often also forcing corporations to rethink their retention strategies. And uh, very often it's also catalyst for the formation of new captives, but also for the increased use of dormant captives. And this then leads also to an increased demand for captive solutions. And I, just in the interest of time, I, I just want to touch briefly on three, of, uh, on three examples. The first one is what we call structured fronting. And with the increased use of captives, in particular in a very international environment, there's also an increased demand for international uh, fronting capabilities. So in this case, the captive borrows or uses the uh, credit rating of an insurer and its capabilities to issue and administer policies in a range of different countries. In its purest form, the insurer passes then 100% of the risk through to the captive, who then may or may not have an, an, a very separate retrocession agreement in the back. The second example in the center is an aggregate stop loss. And these structures are designed to reduce or to limit the volatility in the captive that comes with this increased use of the captives or with these increased retentions. So these ASL, as we call them, um, are actually a sideways protection, and uh, most of the time only the second, third, or, or even the fourth loss are then um, transferred to a reinsurer, and, uh, and that then basically helps to cap the exposure that comes from an um, unexpected frequency of large losses, but also um, if there's an, an event that causes uh, cross-class clashes, where one event causes or Im impacts m many more than just one line of business. Now, the last example uh, for a captive solution is the step-up retention. And this is actually designed to allow new or, or less mature captives to grow their own risk-bearing capacity over time. So it is a multi-year structure, so it gives the captive um, um, a longer-term certainty of price and capacity. But on the other hand, it allows them also to grow organically, reinvesting their own profit into the captive and thereby avoiding new capital injections by the parents. And this is where I would pass on to my colleague, Tom Keist, who will talk about virtual captives. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Thank you, Andre. Um, uh, I am Tom Keist and I'm based in Zurich. But as some of you on the phone know, I was based in Singapore for a while, and that's why I know that Asian markets are uh, quite different uh, from other markets around the world. But at the same time, I think that discussing this concept of virtual captive also makes a lot of sense for your markets, and I really hope that we will have conversations with my colleagues like Andre and his team in Singapore about this concept in the, uh, in the near future, because I believe this is the right solution at this moment for many, many of the corporates we do see in 
Asian markets and also all other markets around the world. We do have a hard market and that's why we are approached for such solutions uh, at the moment a lot. So virtual captives. Andre mentioned this concept before in the context of captives and that's actually the right thing to do because if you think about it, a cap, if you think about the captive first before we go to the virtual captive, well, who is a captive for? Right? A captive suits corporates who have basically decided that the insurance, the concept of insurance as a loss payment instrument is of value. And the risk, that's the second piece, risk, self-finance, self-insurance is the currently economically better choice for them. So two things, right? So number one, insurance. Number two, self-insurance. These both, uh, the, the both of these pieces have to be ticked before a captive comes into uh, the spotlight of, uh, uh, of a thought process. So basically a captive is the insurance alternative for self-financing of risk versus just simply retain the risk on your balance sheet and pay losses as you go, right? So it is for those who have particularly three certain conditions uh, probably currently, actually in the current market, uh, available. Number one is that they have expected losses based on their own analysis that are significantly lower than what current commercial insurance premiums imply. So that's of course a precondition that has to be there. As soon as you believe that your expected loss is actually not lower than what the insurance that the traditional insurance premium is, why would you consider a captive, right? You just, you know, use your uh, usual uh, insurance uh, carriers to take the risk. Then the second piece is that uh, you face a situation where premiums are increasing and in situations like the current one where uncertainty is high, we can assume that premiums could actually increase uh, further in the near future, right? It's more likely that they even go up more than they go down. So if you have this situation and you see that capacity is becoming more and more scarce, this is when you start to think about the captive, right? And number three, many uh, corporate clients, uh, also in, in all markets around the world, they have an intention to access the wholesale reinsurance market in search for better terms and additional capacity. And if you have a captive, you can do that. A captive can reinsure itself in the uh, reinsurance market and with that has a, uh, an access to the wholesale market. So this is about the captive, right? But now, today, we talk about the virtual captive. And what is the virtual captive? The virtual captive is for those corporates who have decided that a captive would be the right answer, so they have ticked all the boxes on the slide before, but they are at the same time evaluating alternatives to setting a captive because they are seeking to avoid all the time needed, the cost and the complexities of setting up a real captive and also very often they are considering later exit options. If you have a captive, once it's established, it's not easy to just walk away. So if you don't want to, uh, you know, if you want to basically in a, in a later soft market, again, exit your captive, you cannot just uh, walk out and close the door. It's more complex. So if you consider that as well, uh, or if you know today that you will have, uh, we will establish a real captive in the near future, but you want the concept of captive to work already today, so you want to maybe bridge the time until a captive is established. That's also when the virtual captive concept can come into the picture. So what is it then? How does it work? It's not a big magic. 
It's basically a multi-year insurance agreement which emulates the mechanics of the traditional captive but on our Swiss Corporate Solutions balance sheet. So what we basically do is we say, well, we do already have a balance sheet. We have the entire infrastructure of an insurance company. Use it. Dear client, use it. Use our balance sheet to imitate the mechanics of a captive with a multi-year insurance agreement that contains certain structural elements. Now, what are these contractual structural elements? <clears throat> there are basically four. <clears throat> um, these four. So, number one, the insurance agreement has to be multi-year. Uh, also, real captive is basically there for an indefinite period. So you cannot do it for, for a one-year uh, agreement. You have to have it multi-year. We say at least three years. Uh, we usually go up to five years. And in most situations, these uh, kind of uh, agreements, if they work well for the client, they will be also then extended. So three to five years is the usual time span. The number two structure element is the premium. And this is very, very important to keep in mind. So the premium to this virtual captive implicitly finances a larger part of the risk over time. But what it means is that the premium is calculated uh, rather conservative. So it's not an aggressive premium. So a virtual captive does not serve to save cash cash outflow, so, so premium cash outflow in year one. Uh, so that's not what the VC is for. It's not to save premium in the first year. The savings, they come in over time, and I come to that in a, just a second. Just, but keep that in mind. So the premium contribution is calculated relatively conservatively, as you would do in a captive as well. If you have your own real captive, you calculate relatively conservatively. And because of that, you then have the low claims bonus. So that's where the saving comes in, right? If the, if the hypothesis that the expected loss is indeed lower than what the commercial insurer's premium are implying, you have a big saving because you will receive a low claims bonus at the end of the period. That is because of the point number two I just made. The the last uh, structural element is the additional premium. So in a real captive situation, if the losses are much worse than expected, you will go to the parent of the captive and say, can you please inject new capital? Now we can't do that because you know, there's no capital injection needed in the first place. So, but what we can do, we can have a structural element of the additional premium. Now, these are the four basic structural elements. But what I need to say here, and this is important, again, Asian markets are different. And therefore, uh, in it, you know, these structural elements on, and how we, uh, we structure them has to vary from market to market. In some uh, jurisdictions, we cannot use exactly these, uh, these structural elements. So I need to put this as a caveat. Please talk to us. We might find solutions, but in some of the markets in Asia, we will not see exactly these structural elements. We will have to use other ways to achieve the same. Okay? So this is important to keep in mind. But as a principle, I wanted to leave these four structural elements because they very clearly and easily explain how this works. One thing I forgot to say, and that is, the low claims bonus, if you think about it, the low claims bonus is a payback of premium paid in case of good loss experience. If you have a real captive, this is the, you know, comparatively the same to the captive paying a dividend to the parent. So if a captive has an underwriting profit at one stage, it will pay a dividend to the parent. So the, lay, the low claims bonus as a concept is exactly that, comparable to that. Last but not least, uh, before I have a little uh, uh, 
a little example, a, small, a simple example, and I have four minutes left. The advantages are vast. So I will not go to each and every of these advantages, but there's a lot of uh, advantages by going for a virtual captive as opposed to a real captive. You don't have the costs involved, the complexities, you have no not to inject any capital, it's relatively speedy to implement. If you want to exit again, you just don't renew the multi-year insurance agreement. And last but not least, you have Swiss financial strength. You use Swiss Swiss balance sheet for your capt uh, virtual captive. So, in terms of an example, this is a, a simplified example <clears throat> and it's a busy slide. I would like to lead you through this one from the left to the right. So, first only look at the left side of the picture. So, <clears throat> we have uh, on the utmost left the situation of this, uh, you know, illustrative uh, corporate client uh, today, and that is that they have an insurance program with a business unit deductible as usual, and we assume the business unit deductible is currently 1 million. And above the 1 million business unit deductible, there's the traditional insurance program covering the rest. Now, because of today's uh, hard market situation, the, the, the corporate client, together with uh, their advisor and broker, decide that uh, the retention actually, you know, the, the retention before the insurance program kicks in should go up to 10 million. And what they would like to do, if they would have a captive, they would use the captive to uh, ensure the difference between the old BUD, the 1 million, and the BUD remains the same, so between the 1 million and the 10 million. So basically, the, the layer 9 XS1 would be covered by the captive. Now, a virtual captive would do exactly the same. It would address the 9 XS1 uh, primary layer, if you like. So if you look at the big blue box, it says virtual captive program. It has every year a 9 million each and every loss coverage. And over the term of three years, we assume, in this illustrative example, an 80 million uh, uh, maximum coverage. Now, <clears throat> below of the box, that's the important piece, right? The premium is every year 3 million plus X. And keep in mind, this is just to illustrate the point about virtual captive. It's not that these numbers are fixed. And this is to illustrate. But 3 million plus X. 3 million times 3 year is 9 million. So this means that this virtual captive is set up to finance at least the first full loss. And because it's a virtual captive program with Swiss Recorporate Solution, the second loss would be taken by Swiss Risk Balance Sheet as a you know, normal risk transfer. So basically, first loss financed through the premium, second loss risk transfer. Now the X, important, what is the X? The X is basically risk and other costs. The risk cost is clear, so as I said, the second loss is basically pure risk transfer, that's, and there's a risk premium to that. And other costs are the costs of providing the infrastructure for the virtual captive. And we can go more into details once about the costs, once you talk to us about, you know, your concrete need. If you go to the right side, we have uh, three scenarios. Uh, on the, so we can see how this works, right? Uh, on the, but I will only go into the top and the bottom. So in the best case, there is, a no, there is no loss. That means every year, year one, year two, year three, premium flows in, but nothing goes out. And therefore, after the deductions of X, which is the cost, remember, the low claims bonus will be paid to the client. In the worst case scenario, that, that's on the bottom, full loss scenario, you have premiums flowing in the same, but because the 18 million are used up fully, there is an ultimate remaining loss to Swiss Corporate Solutions balance sheet. And that's it. That's how this works. Um, I have a last slide 
with some uh, frequently asked questions, but we are running out of time and therefore I would like to hand over to Erika, back to Erika to basically lead us through the general Q&A. Erika? Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Irina. We'll now move on to the Q&A portion. Again, I would like to bring your attention to the Q&A chat box on the left side of your screen. Please type in any questions you may have. So Andre, we have a number of questions and quite a lot of interest on parametric insurance. So these first few questions are for you. So firstly, since parametric um, insurance is a specific cover, is it seen more as a complement or an alternative to traditional insurance program? And secondly, can you ensure um, pandemics through parametric insurance, or is it only for weather-related losses? How about uninsured perils such as supply chain disruption? What is the trigger and how is premium determined? Okay, thank you, um, Erica. So uh, first of all, uh, yes, uh, it's correct. I mean, pandemic, um, parametric insurance is designed to be a complement to traditional insurance because it's not an all risk, it's a single peril and you only insure the probability of this particular event occurring. But there are thousands of other events. So, I mean, you, you can insure the typhoon, but if you have damage due to um, just water ingress or due to an earthquake, that is not insured. So it's really designed to, um, or it's, it's not very efficient to, to insure an all risk via um, by a, p a parametric because you would have to basically ensure each and every scenario and event that could cause you financial uh, loss. So it's, it's really very clearly filling the gaps, sitting side by side of traditional insurance. The second question on pandemic, uh, very good question. We get asked that a lot. Um, yes, I mean, from a structural po point of view, you could and you can, and it has been done, uh, cover pandemic via uh, parametric insurance. And the first, uh, 2017, the World Bank issued a cat uh, pandemic emergency fund for a facility, and there was a parametric pandemic cover, and that was triggered in April of this year. Um, now, I have to basically caution on the, on, on the, on the, yeah, on, on the risk-taking side. We as Swiss Re, we have no appetite to take on these risks. We are very happy or, and we are very much involved with governments uh, for the modeling, for uh, structuring side, but on the risk-taking side, we feel this is more of a public-private uh, public -private partnership because of the systemic nature of this risk. It's, it's certainly not something that the, the private market can take on. And uh, so, but from a structural point of view, yes, it's, I mean, um, if you look at the triggers or possible trigger that I mentioned, you, uh, you can see that, I mean, there are literally only two elements that must be fulfilled. First of all, it, I mean, the trigger needs to be fortuitous. And second, there must be data that we can model it. And if these two uh, conditions are fulfilled, there's always a possibility to, to, to use it as an index for parametric. Um, the third one was basically, uh, uninsured perils and TMD lines. And again, I mean, it, it really, when you're talking parametrics, you always have to go down, what is the event that causes the financial impact? So on TMD lines, a very classic example is really a typhoon. So typhoon really causing damage to TMD lines, you can't insure it, so most of the utilities have to retain that risk. And here, uh, you could really uh, do, and we have done that, uh, that, that parametric insurance for typhoon, basically covers the TND lines. But it's only triggered by a typhoon. So if there is an earthquake or there is a fire that destroys the uh, TND lines, that's then covered by the traditional or uh, retained. Thanks, Andre. Anything to add? So over to you. Over to you now, Tom. The next two questions are around captives and virtual captives. So firstly, what is the maximum capacity of a virtual captive? And secondly, can you give us an idea of the typical or ideal lead time for Swiss Re Corporate Solutions to review and agree on a virtual captive arrangement? 
Okay. So uh, on the first one, maximum capacity. I mean, the the you for us from an uh, from a possibility from a possibility side, you know, the normal capacities we have on the respective line of business would apply. However, what we see on average is that uh, virtual captives like real captives, they are not they are not uh, you know unless they are huge captives or you know they are not used for too lo too large stretches. So on average, we see virtual captives around for the for maybe five million, ten million, fifteen million, yeah. So that's, so that's the range, huh? so up to 15. That's just the usual range and also the range that makes sense. If you think about the illustrative example I did, the client also needs to be prepared to, for example, fully finance a full first loss. So if the stretch is too high, maybe you know, the, you know, it's probably not possible. So we have to think about that. So 5 to 10 to 15 is usually the case. Number two, the typical lead time uh, for Swiss Re to review and agree a virtual captive agreement. So the experience shows, I mean, at the moment we have a high demand search. Uh, so it's, it's a question of, uh, of capacity of underwriters and, uh, and, and actuaries. But I would say you have to come at least three months before you want a virtual captive to incept. In theory, we can do much faster, right? We can do maybe do it in three, four weeks. But uh, I would say at the moment, please bear in mind, you know, there's high demand and therefore scarce resources. Thanks, Tom. And what would the premium level be to qualify for a virtual captive is another question that we've got coming in. Yes. So, as I just said, we have high demand at the moment, so we do not look at opportunities where the premium to the virtual captive layer is expected less than US dollar 1 million per year. So, if it's less, you know, if you expect it less than 1 million US dollar per year to the virtual captive layer, we are hesitant to look at it. It's not that we cannot do it, but it's just a matter of where do we put our priorities. But if you have, uh, you know, if you have good reason uh, uh, to talk to us anyway, please do so. Thanks, Tom. And and finally, still on the topic of virtual captives, we've got a question coming in saying the concept behind the virtual captives sounds very much like spread loss structures that we would access for clients. Back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, is that their immediate access to all capital levels um, with delayed payments based on claims or not? Would that be accurate? And it sounds like a great concept and something that's been missing for many years. <laughs> yes uh, and no, right? So I think we should, you know, we should maybe move on from the few that when we talk about structured insurance solutions, we talk about the same concept as we did in the 90s. So in the 90s, the problem was the motivation of clients and why they did a structured insurance solution. The motivation was very often to optimize the corporate tax situation. And what we have now is, number one, we have a uh, an industry that has developed far, you know, when you look at the captive industry, and keep in mind what we're trying to do here is imitate the workings of a captive one to one. That's what we're trying to do. And the captive market and how it's viewed and valued and regulated has developed over the past 20 years, number one, so that's number one, and we are, we are applying all these, uh, all these developments. And number two, the motivation is a completely different one. What we're trying to do is we're using the concept of a captive uh, approach to self-finance risk over time exactly the same way as a captive does. And that's the motivation. It has nothing to do with tax, nothing to do with accounting. And that's the big difference. Thanks, Tom. So next question I'd like to pass over to Irina. 
With a faster recovery in China slash Asia, will insurers increase their investments there? Uh, so uh, let us put it in the different perspective, right? So um, if we look at it from the opportunities of the market's perspective, the the answer is yes. And then also when we look at, look at with the investment, we have looked at it in a short-term recovery and also a long-term opportunities. For instance, in um, in Asia, uh, uh, China and many of the other emerging uh, Asian markets, they are actually on our very famous Swiss as S curve. Okay, this is uh, that means that you know they are still had a very high uh, elasticity to the change in. Uh, the, the income growth. So uh, we we find that actually uh, the premium growth uh, of uh, is mainly driven by the GDP or the income growth. So in China and many of the Asian markets, the the number is higher than one. That means you have one percent GDP growth and you have more than one percent uh, generated premium growth. For instance, in China, the, the current electricity uh, long term is around one point five. And then uh, we also look at it like uh, this: the, the Asian, especially the emerging Asian market, uh, leading by China, really will take up a very um, increasing share of the global insurance market. Actually, in our forecast, we see China will become the largest insurance market by mid of 2030. And uh, in the short term, when we start, uh, talk about this recovery for this COVID, and uh, you know, Susie actually did. Um, consumer survey uh, in uh, April, and then they find that in, in four Asian markets, including China, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Australia, that actually we showed a very strong, uh, I would say, uh, uh, with awareness and strong interest to buy more insurance. And then, uh, you know, uh, actually, um, uh, ab ab about 50% uh, uh, of the uh, respondents say that they actually reach out to our insurers um, doing the, even during the COVID time to check out for more insurance policies. And this number is as high as 75% in China. But when we talk about the investment, you really have to think about, you know, right now COVID also let us have a, a very, um, I would say, uh, the, uh, which, con uh, which distribution channel and it because uh, companies and the consumers are now become more digital uh, active, I would say. So yes, the answer is yes, but also, you know, in which er area of investment, we will see that more will come into the digitalization. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. We've got time for one last question. And for that, I'll pass over to Andre. We've got a question from the floor. If your insurance exclude, excluded an extreme weather event, for example, cyclones, is this where you would take out parametric insurance for a cyclone event? How is this beneficial over a policy that does not include, exclude cyclones? Um, yes, I mean, if, if, if you have a policy that does not cover cyclone, uh, then you can cover it via uh, a parametric. That's an alternative, but if you have an insurance that covers cyclone, I would recommend against to, uh, taking it out and, and replacing it by, an, uh, by a parametric because it's not efficient. So it's really filling the gaps um, that are there. I mean, it is beneficial in, in that sense. You can also add it. Even if your insurance uh, covers cyclone, you might add a parametric cyclone insurance. The, only, the reason for it is because imagine you have a hotel resort, an island resort, and you have a typhoon going or a cyclone going over it. The traditional insurance will only cover you to rebuild or to repair it and, and basically also for the business interruption. But if in the year afterwards no guests are coming and there's a complete uh, basically loss of attraction as a tourist destination of this island, that is really where you have a financial loss which no other insurance, traditional insurer would pick up. So there if you have in addition an, uh, a parametric, we pay because the typhoon happened, you get money. So it's really complementing and see what is the exposure and is it covered by my traditional insurance? If not, then, um, then parametric could be an, op uh, an option. So always think is really, is all my financial impact covered? And not only the physical damage, but it's really much broader than, than just uh, uh, um, the physical damage or the business interruption, like for example, loss of attraction or supply chain disruption.
Thank you, Andre. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for being a great audience. We appreciate your attention and also all your questions. Before we close the call, if you have a second, let us know what you thought of the virtual event by clicking on a number between 0 and 10. The recording of this webinar will be available in the coming days in case you want to listen again or share it with any of your contacts. In the meantime, please reach out to any of today's presenters with questions. We've been more than happy to continue the conversation with you. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.